Hey everybody, I want to talk about a product and platform that I absolutely love and our latest sponsor, Interseller, the prospecting and outreach platform of choice for recruiters and sellers. Whether you're doubling down on business development or recruiting talent, Interseller does all the heavy lifting of finding contact data, automating the email and follow-up process, and syncs all that rich data into 20 plus CRM and ATS platforms. Reach out now and get going on a two-week free trial and let them know you heard about it from Adam on the podcast today. Check out the link on the website. Appreciate it. Welcome to the podcast, where we introduce you to incredible humans who share their journeys with the mission to inspire you to harness your own inner tenacity to drive your life and career forward. And now, your host, Adam Posner. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the podcast where I bring you the best and brightest from the world of business, marketing, recruiting, and personal growth to help you harness your inner tenacity and drive your career forward. Folks, I got a good one today. My guest and my buddy, Scott McGregor, is the founder and CEO of Something New, a talent acquisition firm that focuses on core attributes like integrity, transparency, giving back, and attention to detail to build lasting relationships with its clients. Something New was built after Scott spent years in the industry learning how Strong businesses and teams are built from the ground up. And early in his career, he was the youngest national account manager in a Fortune 500 company, Pitney Bowes. That's pretty cool. I didn't know that. He was then recruited by a tech startup, Flowtech, where he managed to guide the business to double-digit growth for 17 years straight. Guy's been around the block. I'm not trying to make you sound old. We're just giving some background here, man. And now he's achieving new heights by guiding something new to the five-time American Business Award winner for innovation. Scott is also the author of the Standing O series, which we'll talk about, where he compiles the stories of esteemed individuals focusing on gratitude for a good cause. And 100% of the proceeds go to charity. Good stuff. And we're catching up with Scott today to talk about all the latest of the Standing O series, the Standing O salute, along with much more about his story, recruiting the world of talent access, and in this amazingly wonderful, awful time of COVID. We'll get to all that and more. Scott McGregor, welcome to the podcast, my friend. What is up, Adam, my good friend? How are you? Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on. It's been a long time in the making. I'm glad that we could do that. So let's jump in here. Um, hopefully, a lot of my tribe knows you, but some of them may not. We have some new listeners and new audience as well. So I'd love if you could take a moment and just bring us up to speed, real quick elevator pitch on your career and background, anything that I might have missed there. I think I covered a lot, but tell us, as I say in our recruiting world, Scott, tell us who you are and what you do best. Yeah, real real quick. So my career started uh, in sales. I knew I was going to get into sales because I really wasn't qualified to do much else. Uh, I was a big relationship guy uh, and and I thought I would do well in sales. I had a, a best friend whose father was a VP of sales and he kind of became a mentor. So uh, out of college, you know, uh, started selling uh, copiers of, of all things and brutal business. But I was super disciplined and like crazy, crazy motivated, and I did very, very well. Uh, and then I went to Pitney Bowes and was an individual contributor, was the the youngest national account manager in the history of the company, and then took my first leadership role in my mid-20s uh, and took a team from 40% of quota to the number one team in the country. Uh, so that kind of started my talent journey. Um, of really thinking about how to build teams uh, and then got recruited by a startup. There was about five people uh, in this company and was there as their chief revenue officer for 17 years, which does make me old as you know what. Um, (laughs) And uh, we were very fortunate. We grew double digits every year for 17 straight years and had hundreds of employees uh, and but nagging at me the whole time was kind of this passion that I had for recruiting and relationships and people would call me on a fairly regular basis and say hey Scott I'm looking for this person or that person and I could kind of always make those connections meanwhile I was having less than stellar experiences with recruiters And I said, you know what? I think I could build a different mousetrap almost six years ago. uh, That's what I did and started something new. 
That's interesting too. I mean, you and I, I mean, you, you have a bit more, a couple more years on me, you know, but a lot more years, Yeah. but, but the recruiting side, we, we've roughly been in it. Uh, and, and for, it's always interesting yeah. to, to hear about people's journeys there, but I want to go back and talk about, you know, your time at Flowtech. I mean, 17 years is a long time with, you know, consistent growth there. Like how do you, you know, year after year, I mean, folks, I mean, this is a new world, right? There's people that don't like yeah. that. Our parents stayed in companies for years and years, but how do you sustain that energy and that momentum year after year? For 17 years you know growing double digits uh in the beginning when you're starting from scratch is is really easy so i mean i take <laughs> zero credit for you know when you're when you're double digit growth and you're you're going from nothing it's it's not really that great of an accomplishment but you know as we became a 10 million 20 million 30 million dollar company and we continue to grow at a double digit clip you know it it, it becomes a lot more challenging I honestly, I attribute it to the talent. I mean, we had a phenomenal team. Uh, we went one one stretch. We went nine years without losing anybody, which I still think is like a Guinness World Book of Records. No attrition uh, in the company for nine years. In my in my sales and marketing group. Yep, that no, is no, insane. And what, give us like insane. a rough. Time. I've never what, heard of anything like, like what it. what years were that roughly? Like I'm just trying to get a sense. In the beginning, uh, from yeah. the beginning, so we went the first nine years of the seventeen uh, and, with, without losing anybody. And let's talk about that. I mean, how, what do you attribute that success to? Was it really? Was it building the culture? Was it like profits? Like was it compensate? Like what was what was that chemistry there that made that magic formula? What was the secret sauce? It's there? a com it was a combo. Um, I think it was a phenomenal culture. Um, we were people were making a ton of money. Uh, we that were helps. very innovative because we were doing something that nobody was doing. So we literally invented a space. So the space that we were occupying uh, was something that nobody had ever heard of. We we're calling on CIOs and CFOs of Fortune 500 companies. And they were like, I've never heard of this type of service. Right. Um, so they were receptive to to really listening to to something that was pretty right. at the time pretty revolutionary. So all, the, so all those pieces were there, but you as a leader of that team, you know, and and this is going to translate into going into the recruiting and everything there too. Like, what did you learn about how to be a leader from the cultural perspective? I mean, I think I learned that early on, probably at Pitney, and I probably even learned more lessons from, you know, I was super blessed in high school. I played for two Hall of Fame football coaches, so that was kind of a, a unique experience to be able to to play for, for two Hall of Famers and, and really understand how to lead uh, people. Um, and, yeah. you know, so I think it, it, it evolved over time. Um, but certainly, you know, my time at at Flowtech building a team from scratch and building it, uh, you know, to a pretty, pretty big group, um, I made a lot of mistakes, uh, but had really, I think people have always known my AI, which is not my artificial intelligence, kind of my aim and intention is always good. Um, so, you know, people tended to to follow uh, and want to be a part of, of something that was pretty interesting. And how, how did you make folks on the team feel valued? Cause I really truly think that that's a cornerstone of culture that often goes un unmentioned because, you know, and I could say it all the time, listen, culture is not ping pong tables and cold brew on tap. Culture right. is really about someone feeling valued in an organization that their contributions are valued and that they have a clear career path trajectory. And that starts with the leadership. So how did you ensure like along the way, I mean, you learned a lot along the way, but how did you ensure that the team felt valued and appreciated? Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty simple stuff. I, I think truly, if you if you don't care about people, which there, there are a lot of people that truly don't, um, they care about maybe the end result, but they don't really truly care about their people. I really, care about uh the people that i'm blessed to work with so i mean i just had to take a very personal interest in them and i got to know their their wives and husbands and kids and hobbies and all those other things so Be it was kind of managing the full person rather than you know just kind of are you hitting your quota are you doing what you need to do uh, from a business standpoint. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think that's critical. So let's talk about that pivot into the world of recruiting. And you mentioned that you were looking to build a better mousetrap. So what was yeah. it 
what was that impetus, right? Were you working with outside recruiters? Were you like utilizing agencies? And you're like, this shit ain't working. Like something's not right here. Yeah. It seems so transactional. Like what was that moment? I mean, maybe it was one moment. Maybe it was a little bit of a journey there. But what, <laughs> right? But like what got you into recruiting? This is a good story. So, uh, you know, we were growing so fast that even like 2008, when the economy was horrible, we were growing like crazy. So every recruiter in the world was calling because it seemed like we we're the only people hiring. And, you know, they would call with the typical like, hey, I've got perfect people for you. And I would think you don't even know who I am. You don't know anything about me, the company, what my needs are. And so the experiences over a long protracted period of time were not good. Lack of process, just kind of throwing bodies out there, um, kind of the opposite of what you do with your your agency. And that's why you've been successful. Um, so the, just the typical stuff that you always hear complaints about with recruiters was stuff that I was constantly uh, faced with. And so this is the embarrassing part. I actually put together a business plan seven years in um, and I said, OK, these are the problems I'm facing. This is how I would solve them. And then I sat on that business plan for a decade I literally sat on the business plan for 10 years. And, this is a uh, and finally, my wife. Uh, so the reason why I did, I grew up very poor in an affluent town, which is a crazy way to grow up. It's right. just when you're surrounded by people that are, you know, doing things that you could never even dream of doing. Um, it's just a real weird way to, uh, weird. to kind of grow up. So I, I couldn't fathom leaving such a big paycheck, um, even though I wasn't completely satisfied and I was super passionate about building this business, but I was building it in my mind and I was building it on paper. And my wife is really the one that finally kicked me in the ass. And she's like, listen, you know, this is what you talk about. Think about, you know, if you've got spare time, this is what you're doing. Uh, just do it. Jump off the cliff and do it which was terrifying for me, but I did. And, you know, best decision I ever made. Right. And I'm, and I'm smirking over here because, you know, my, my story is similar, right? When I was working for a search agency and I wasn't yep. happy, wasn't happy with the relationship, wasn't happy about the business model. And my wife said the same thing to me. She's like, you're not happy. You could do this on your own. And that was, you know, that was my impetus. So I always say behind every good man or woman is another good man or woman uh, to, to drive you in the right direction. So, Something new. I mean, let's talk about the title first. I mean, it, is it really was it really that literal? I mean, I've told my story of my title of my company, but how did you come up with that title? Were you like, well, I'm just looking for something new. People are looking for something new. Let's call it something new. Yeah, it just kept uh, coming into my head that what what I needed to build was something new. And I'm like, well, OK, I'm going to use that name and it's going to also put the pressure on me year over year because if you call your company something new and six years later, you're doing the same thing then you know you're you're not that authentic and that innovative so i like pressure and i love the pressure of when you call your company something new it's like okay we can't sit back and rest on our laurels like we have to constantly be innovating and that's why those awards that you mentioned for innovation you know 5 years in a row it's like we continue to innovate year after year after year. Right. So let's talk about innovation. Let's talk about your model. Why? How is your model different and, and how are you innovating it? I mean, I, I don't think it's there. There's not uh, a lot of folks out there doing things the way that we do it. Um, and, you know, the reasons for that, are we, we could spend probably an hour uh, talking about that and maybe we'll do it over a beer. But I know that, right. you know, you've you've implemented some innovative things in terms of your fees. So I thought fee structures were completely screwed right. up. It made Agreed. no sense. Uh, I thought the process was totally broken. I didn't see anyone using a data-driven approach. Uh, people were sourcing candidates in kind of a, a really ineffective way. So just kind of diving into LinkedIn, flailing around, trying to hit warm bodies. So we use an influencer network to find people, which is very uh, unusual. And, and then there was no give back component. So that's a big piece of our yeah. kind of company DNA. Yeah, and we'll, and we'll get into that. And and just, you know, to check the box here, what areas do you specialize in recruiting and talent for? 
sales and marketing leadership. Uh, I mean, we'll do anything within sales and marketing, but really it's it's mostly, you know, I would say the last uh, God knows how many searches we've done have been CROs, uh, VPs of sales. So executive search we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Got it. Um, and when you go in and you pitch clients, I mean, maybe you're not pitching clients anymore. Maybe business is coming to you. But how do you position that, right? Because one of the things that we hear, and I've heard it before too, and I've seen it and I've done it myself earlier on, is that pitch. We're different. We're more focused on the client. We're more focused on the candidate. We have more white glove treatment, right? But what is that hook? Why do companies want to work with you guys? So uh, this is going to sound crazy and some people may not believe it, but it's the truth. Uh, so six years in, we've never made a cold call. Uh, we've never done email blasts. Uh, we've had business literally come to us from day one. Um, and that has spiraled now uh, because we have a lot of really happy clients and a lot yep. of these C firms that we work with that are very, very happy with the experience that they've had. I mean, we, you know, we just won best of staffing and our net promoter score was 94.4%. That's great. The industry average is 28. Um, yep. So we're clearly giving people something and, that they don't have. Right. And it's that recommendation for the MPS. I mean, that's a referral score, right? How likely are you to refer this business right. to uh, yep. a, a, you know, a, a colleague or another company, which is tremendous. And how big is it, How big is the team now, if you don't mind me asking? We've got 12 people uh, all over the country from literally Montana to Minneapolis, to Philadelphia, Jersey, Connecticut, kind of all over the place. And why do you think, you know, from from your perspective, that so many of these companies are still doing it the old way, the the fee, the spray and pray, the dial, smile and dials, right? I mean, is it because it still works and they're still generating revenue? I mean, they're not getting with the times. They're not focusing on content. They're not focusing on recruitment marketing. Like what you and I do is we, we've created brands for our companies and that's right. what attracts candidates and clients and it makes it warmer to warmer. It's, I don't call it cold calls. I call it warm connecting. Yeah. Um, why do people do it like that? I mean, I think number one, that people are pretty lazy. Um, I, I, I don't think people are very creative. Uh, I think people do not understand the power of relationships, the power of branding, the power of the LinkedIn platform. I mean, it blows my mind when I see recruiters that are doing nothing on LinkedIn. I'm nothing. like, my God, it's 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 like stealing. Uh, every single client and every single candidate lives on this platform. Mm -hmm. How are you producing no content? How are you asleep? To me, like completely asleep at the wheel. I agree. Um, I don't get it. I, I, right. And that's, and that's one of the things too, like I went all in, right? Like when I launched the company three years ago, I mean, I come from a marketing background, so I had a, I had a very strong competitive advantage. And what I call it is recruitment marketing. It's more recruitment. There's a combination there of why I'm attracting right. clients and candidates. And, and more importantly, this show, this works for both of us, man. I'm going to put it out there and it's a business dev tool. I mean, technically we're competitors, but we're not. I truly believe in collaboration and I believe that this is going to benefit both of us. And that's why I created this platform. One of the other things that you coined, um, something that I absolutely love, I have this sticker on the back of my computer here, is people over everything. Please tell us the origin yeah. and what does that truly mean to you, Scott? It, pe people are always the most important thing in an organization. And I think uh, so often, especially in hyper growth startups, which I know is an area you specialize in, people fall in love with their product. Um, and they think that their product is what's going to differentiate them and make them successful. But when you look at any organizations that's successful, it's because of their people. There's not a product out there. There's not a service out there that just kind of spontaneously came to be. There's always people behind it. And it's the people that make Google a great company. It's the people that make Amazon or Apple or you name the successful company. It's, it's always people over everything. I um, and I think when you put the focus on that, when you think about it, you know, and, and you probably have the same dialogue. When I talk to a CEO and they agree that their number one expense is employees, labor, and the number one differentiator that will make them either succeed or fail is people, yet they spend no time sitting down talking about 
how to create a better talent strategy, it's kind of a head scratcher. It doesn't make any sense. Right. Um, and that's where we come in because I think, you know, we're able to give them a lot of best practices and, and do a lot more. And I know you do this too. We do so much more than just find somebody. Right. It's not just putting a warm body in a seat. That's It's a lot more than that. It's, it's the relationship. It's the added value. How could you add value to your clients in addition to just right. recruiting? And the other piece too, which I talk about, and it's my selling point all the time, is your recruiter, whether using an agency, in-house, whatever, they're your brand ambassador. They're sure. the first contact point any potential new employee has with your organization. Don't you want that to be an insanely amazing experience? Don't you want your recruiter, whether it be outside agency, you, right. me, whoever, third party, to be able to properly articulate your company's story, your culture, and your company's why? Well, so we always say, you know, companies seem fixated on the one person they're going to hire, forgetting that, let's just say in the course of that search, you're going to have 99 other people that aren't going to get the job. And depending on how they're treated, they're going to be either advocates or adversaries for your business. Yeah, they're, they're potentially and, your customers. Absolutely. So why wouldn't, even though they're not going to get the job and they're not going to work for your company, if you have 99 advocates versus adversaries, I mean, that's a win all day long. Right. Employee engagement. Empl I mean, candidate engagement and candidate experience always have to be top of mind. So speaking of, I mean, what's your approach? I mean, how do you go about hiring folks on your team? Um, you know, do you do you look for recruiters that come from a little bit different background? Do you or do you want to find folks that come from like that standard organization or do you, do you like to break them in your way? Like what's your approach to hiring for your team? It's really so it's two things. It's head and heart. Uh, it, are they really bright? And do they have a great, a, a big heart? Um, because those those are the two criteria that I'm looking at the most. I don't really even care if somebody has a recruiting background. I mean, we have people on the team from the largest recruiting firm in, in the world. We have people on the team from Corn Ferry. Uh, but we have people on the team that have no recruiting experience at all, which I kind of, I guess, would prefer. Uh, because I think so many recruiters have picked up really poor habits uh, that I'd rather not have to break them of those habits. The habits are and, terrible, and, and man. Teach them how to do it the right way. Yeah, man. I mean, I was lucky. I mean, I I, I got taught on day one from a veteran old school recruiter who taught yeah. me the the art and science of recruiting, and he taught me the tactics to understand the candidate's motivation, which I think is really key. Like understanding that art of recruiting, because science part isn't that hard to teach. Right. If you're using ATS platforms, if you're using search tools, it's not that hard to do keyword searches. But the real engagement, the real work is building and forming that relationship with clients and candidates. And that and that's not easy. And that's why it's interesting, too. And I smile when when I heard you say that you hire people who don't come from recruiting backgrounds. Yeah. I mean, my first job, they took a chance on me because I came from a marketing background and the roles that I was going to be working were marketing. And they saw that competitive advantage. And, you know, and, and, and the rest, as they say, you know, is history. Um, let's talk a little bit about how COVID has affected um you know, overall talent. I know that you're saying business is good right now. Um, I mean, I personally saw a dip. I mean, I think almost all industries saw a dip there. Um, but from your perspective, what's your kind of, you know, top line review on COVID and recruiting? Yeah, I mean, it How definitely, uh, you know, I would say summertime was a, a lull that we hadn't experienced before. And I think it was a combination of really uh, you know, not a great market uh, for people hiring, but also summer that other than that, I mean, it's been a good year. We grew again this year, which is is great. Um, I'm definitely not like I, I don't panic. Uh, and even in the beginning, uh, I put a post out very, very early and said, like, this is a moment in time. Uh, I still believe that. I mean, it's a okay. it's a shitty moment in time. But it's just a moment in time and it will pass. Uh, I so I think staying really disciplined and not like going off the reservation and doing crazy stuff, we definitely pivoted and we did a lot more in our, in our advisory services. So we have two different advisory services in addition to recruiting um, that we, we put a lot of focus on and Smart. that business exploded. Uh, and while recruiting was a little bit dormant, uh, in the summer, and now we're seeing recruiting pick back up and you probably yeah, experienced the same thing. I'd say the last like month, month and a half right. has been, you know, and, really strong. 
And the point of differentiation that you mentioned is the the ability to diversify your offering, right? To be able right. to have mul multiple revenue streams and multiple offerings, which I think is critical because it goes back to the concept of being invaluable. What are the services? There's a, right. there's a knowledge that you and your team have in addition to just the recruiting, the process, the culture, uh, the, the, the candidate, um, you know, experience. And those are all things that companies need. I want to touch back to something LinkedIn before, because you've built a great brand on LinkedIn. Um, you know, what's kind of your approach? Like, how do you put yourself out there to establish as a thought leader? You know, what have you been doing that you found successful? <laughs> I, I mean, I definitely put my thoughts out there on a regular basis. I am not very uh, systematic about it. Like, I don't, I don't, think about like, okay, and I'm making this up because I don't even know what, what's right. Thursday at two o'clock is the best time to post. Okay. I never give that a thought. Literally what happens most days is something that happened to me or something that happened in our business or to a client or to a teammate, you know, it sparks something. And I say, I, I think this is something that will resonate and I'll write a post or I'll make a video or, or do whatever and put some content out. Um, I'm not real uh, systematic about that approach. Right. What I different am, approaches. I'm I'm really uh, I'm very consistent. So I'm consistently showing up, and I think well, that's also key. because I don't show up the same exact way all the time. Um, maybe it's a little I bit more that. interesting. Yeah, I, I like that too. And and you know, my system is interesting too because I'm always going to have my evergreen content. Right, I'm promoting yep. a show. And I have a, a cadence that I want to put out there. So you're always going to get one of those every day because that's just a stream there. But then I have my train of thought messages, which actually perform great on the platform. Um, people love it, right? Where I'm literally, it's like, you know, 930 at night, I'm sitting on the couch. And I'm like, holy shit, right. this epiphany just came into my head. Yeah. And I kind of mix it up there. But you hit, you hit a good point. You want to show different sides of it to build up that audience. So, so that's LinkedIn. Um, I want to talk about, you know, what's behind you right now, um, the books, which are which are pretty awesome. And I loved when I got my book a few months back, because in addition to the book, it wasn't just a book. And it wasn't just the author yourself signing it to, but there was a full care package, you know, and, and it really meant something, a handwritten note. I want to say I appreciate that approach here. So for anyone not familiar with the book series, tell us a little bit more about, you know, what it's all about and and what was the impetus behind creating the series? Well, the first one, actually, let's so, get into the first. So one. giving back is is really one of the main reasons why I, I started the company. So I was at a point in my career where, you know, and this is not to sound like, oh, you know, I've got uh, like all this money because I don't. Um, but I, I wasn't like, you know, I want to start this business because I want to be a millionaire and I want to like, you know, buy a Bentley and a bigger house and whatever. Like that was never, you know, a thought whatsoever. It really was, I wanted to do something that I thought was valuable to the business community and to candidates. And I wanted to create a mechanism that through our business success, we could give back because that's the most important thing to me. So I actually had an idea that was probably not a great idea that turned into a decent idea. So I, I've been super blessed that I've got this crazy eclectic group of friends that are Olympians and pro athletes and best-selling authors and CEOs. And I've just developed amazing relationships with a, a lot of incredible people. And I thought, well, okay, how do I leverage that um, to do something good? And my first thought was to do like a short form podcast where I'd bring somebody on and they'd give a tip and then I thought, you know what? I'm not Adam. I'm not going to be work. able to do a podcast like this. So uh, what can I do? And I said, you know what? Why don't, uh, why don't I ask all of these friends of mine to write a chapter of gratitude for a life lesson that they learned? And that was the original book, Standing O. So Dick Vermeil wrote the foreword, you know, Super Bowl winning coach. Tiki Barber wrote the cover quote, and we have people in there like Jesse Itzler and just amazing people. Um, that book worked really, really well. All the proceeds go to charity. Um, so because I'm not probably the brightest guy in the world, I'm like, well, if that worked, I probably have another 50 some odd friends. Right. Why Let's don't I it do it again? Um, so we came out with Standing O Encore. Uh, again, that worked really, really well. Um, and 
you know, it's like a wash, rinse, repeat type of thing. The third book, which just came out, is Standing O Salute. So I have a real affinity for our military. Uh, so both of my sons were in the military, and I have a ton of friends uh, who have been in the military. Uh, so Standing O Salute was, is, is the book that just came out. It's all military, uh, special ops, Navy SEALs, Rangers, I love it. Marines, uh, just general, every, somebody from every branch uh, of the service. And all the proceeds from that book go to the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. So it's awesome. It's just been a great mechanism to give back. Um, and it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work, but it's uh, it's a lot of fun. And talking about standing O salute, you know, what's that common thread that, you know, when, when someone picks up the book and they read it and they read each one of these chapters and stories, you know, specifically around standing O salute, what is that common thread and theme across all of them? It's it's really amazing because the 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 subject is the same. So it's write a chapter of gratitude to somebody or people that have taught you a life lesson. So you're getting kind of the person is memorializing somebody for teaching them something and then hopefully giving that advice to the audience. So the, the chapters Painted themselves forward. are all around that theme, but they're very eclectic. So for instance, in the first book um, in Standing O, we had one friend of mine who played for the Jets. His name's Mark Brown. Uh, he wrote a chapter called Dear Football. And it was a letter to a sport because his gratitude, he grew up in Patterson, New Jersey. Uh, and really, football is what got him a scholarship to Auburn. Eventually, Pulled him up. You know, playing for the Jets and, and changed his life. Uh, Max Allshuler, who you may or may not know, uh, you know, as an author himself and a wildly successful entrepreneur, he wrote his about infomercials and what he learned about infomercials. Now, most people wrote theirs about a grandparent, a coach, uh, a teacher, uh, somebody that they work with professionally. Um, but they're very, very eclectic. And I think that's what makes them interesting. I, and I love it. And let's talk about the charity. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong here, but proceeds from this book specifically um, are going with the Special Ops Warrior Foundation, correct? Correct. Special Operations and, Warrior Foundation. Uh, and they do incredible work. And, and, and why that organization specifically? Why does that resonate with you? So a very good friend of mine who actually wrote the cover quote, uh, he's a 30-year Navy SEAL commander. His name's uh, Todd Seneff. Um, I was talking to Todd and I was talking to some other guys uh, in the special ops world and they kept and we were trying to figure out, you know, what charity are we going to pick? So we always want to pick uh, some uh, a charity that's smaller, that needs name recognition and funding. Um, so, for instance, Wounded Warrior is a phenomenal organization, right? but they're massive but they and they really get, need yeah. the publicity that I can give them and they don't really need. The Smart. money that I can give them as much as uh, Special Operations Warrior Foundation. So it was a recommendation from a bunch of buddies of mine uh, who all were like, this is an amazing group. And then I met Clay Hutmacher and I met Sean Corrigan who are running uh, the, the organization. I'm like, these guys are amazing. They're doing great work. So that's how that's it happened. That's fantastic. And, and definitely kudos to that. So, so everyone who's listening right now, why should somebody go out and pick up these books? Uh, you're going to learn uh, a life lesson from somebody who has done extraordinary things in their life. A hundred percent of the proceeds are going to go to charity. Uh, it's a super easy read. So there's 43 chapters in Standing O Salute. Uh, there's 53 in Standing O Encore. There's 52 in Standing O. So you literally, you can read, you know, it's a couple page chapter uh, in the morning or before you go to bed. Uh, and get inspired. So uh, to fantastic. me, it's fourteen ninety nine. It's a no brainer, right? And we're going to link it up in the comments. We'll link it up in the show notes for everything. So let's bring it home yeah. here. Um, and it's and it's great work, and it's awesome, and I love the purpose behind it. Like I, I really do. Like this isn't your core business. In fact, you're donating the proceeds. This is the giving back component, and it just ties into everything that you're doing and giving, and it's awesome. And I love it. And I'm actually inspired on this one. I'm I'm putting this in my long term plan here. I think I might be able to do something. Similar with this show. Maybe I could turn it into uh Yeah, somebody into... <laughs> said to me the other day, I have an idea and I hope you don't mind if I steal it because it's kind of 
the same theme and I'm like, are you kidding me? Steal away. I don't, it, you know, this is not proprietary. Yeah. I, I, if everyone wants to do it, I think that's great. And let's, and it's awesome. And let's bring it home here. Um, you know, if anybody who listens to the show and I, and I hope you have too, there's a series of questions that I love to ask because for me, it's my masterclass, right? For me, and it's different perspectives, the same way I assume when you write your book and you, you ask, you know, you interview, you know, the authors and you're having these conversations, it's osmosis and you're yeah. learning so much, yep. right? And you're learning too. So, you know, I start with this one, you know, I, I, I'm attracted to you as a professional. I'm attracted to you because I believe that you're authentic. I believe that what you see is what you get. You're the real you. And that's awesome. But what does that word mean to you, Scott? What does the word authentic mean? I mean, authentic is really showing up who you really are. And that's kind of warts and all. Um, I think, you know, unfortunately, and, and I have some interesting dialogue with some people that really focus on authenticity a lot. I always say the problem is there are authentic assholes out there. And if you are authentically uh, that type of person, I, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, I, it's That's a curse. Um, and they need to figure stuff out. But I, I think the secret is... You know, you've got to show up authentically, but you've got to have some substance behind you. You've got to be a good person because otherwise yeah, showing absolutely. up authentically is uh, yeah. is a disaster. And, and I'm laughing here and I'm not going to get political. And we're not going to have a political conversation. But I was having this conversation with somebody. Actually, I was having this conversation with my wife a couple of weeks ago before the election. And we said, you know what? It doesn't matter what side you're on politically. But I think the one thing that we could all agree on, Trump is the most authentic president we've ever had like he is who he is right yeah whatever whatever interpretation whatever right, whatever interpretation of that is but right. you're getting the real deal i don't think he could be anything but his authentic self right right it's so like, you know i think that plays to a certain audience and it completely repels another absolutely. audience but you know yeah, he is being who he is and the chips fall you know i i I, I i give a check mark i give a check mark in that box for him all the time and i think that's uh really interesting we could probably talk for a couple yeah. hours just about that yeah. alone but let's bring it back here um again you've had the opportunity to connect befriend advise mentor be mentored yourself from so many amazing folks uh in this universe but scott what is the single greatest piece of advice you've ever received that you take action on every single day um you know jesse itzler is a really good friend of mine i don't know if you know jesse of but course he's, he's amazing um and i really uh I believe in kind of the way he lives his life and be where your feet are is one of the things that he says, not, not just to me, but to a lot of people and kind of be present. Um, and, you know, so a lot of what Jesse talks about um, and we've, you know, had opportunities to talk about, those are things that really resonate with me. Um, so I try to stay in the moment um, and not kind of look back. Uh, and not really look too much into the future and kind of really enjoy or deal with whatever it is that I'm, I'm faced with at that particular time. Yeah, I love it. And, and that's, a, that's a great one for sure. Um, and what would you say your superpower is, man? What makes you, you know, special who you are? Um, you know, I was talking about this the other day. I have a learning disability um, that has probably created some superpowers. So for instance, like if you said put together an Excel spreadsheet, you know, you're going to put a gun to my head, like I'd, I'd be dead. Um, Cause there's just certain things I, I just can't do. Of course. Um, but I think because of those things, I've really doubled down on some things that I've just been maybe naturally good at, which is developing connections and developing real relationships. So people will say, you know, you've got whatever, you know, all these connections on LinkedIn and it's like, yeah, but those are meaningless unless they're real relationships. 100%. So that's why the books mean so much to me because 150 friends have said, yeah, I'll take time out of my busy life to write a chapter that's real. Um, because we're, we're genuine. We have a real relationship. And that's really, that's real relationship capital. That's real network net worth. And that's something that I preach all the time. You could, you could, you could collect numbers. You could con connect 
collect connections. That means shit. It's the real relationships. It absolutely does. And, you know, you mentioned a few of these things before when we we're talking about COVID, but I'd love if you could share, because I want to end on positivity. Somebody that I admire, Steve Noodleberg, when I interviewed him over the summer, you know, he, he says, tell me something good. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm like, I'm going to steal that from you, but I'm going to put my spin on it. And I like to talk about silver linings. And I'd love if you could share with us a personal and professional silver lining that you've experienced over the last, geez, 10 months. Uh, I would say, you know, I'm so grateful uh, for what we have, you know, which is an incredible team. I really haven't viewed uh, COVID as this kind of horrible uh, thing. I mean, I, I understand the devastation that it's had on people from a job perspective. I understand, obviously, people have, have, have died. Um, but, you know, not being able to go to a restaurant or having to wear a mask or things like that, like that, whatever, it's just kind of doesn't really affect me at all. Um, so I'm just constantly thinking of the things I do have rather than the things I don't have. Um, so the silver lining is it's, it's helped in that regard as well, but also I always view adversity as, a positive thing, not a negative thing. So I look at it as I just built a more substantial callus that the next time something bad happens, which there's a train around the corner all the time or a bus that's going to hit you. You don't know what it is. I mean, we weren't, no, I don't think anyone was prepared for COVID, but I was definitely prepared from a business standpoint and just mentally myself that something is going to happen and I've got to be prepared. And because I've gone through a lot of uh, difficulties in my life, uh, I've built up those calluses. So this is just another callus that I don't know what's going to happen two years, three years, four years, five years, 10 years down the road, something will. Um, and I'll be more prepared for it because of COVID. And yeah, I love it. And 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 you mentioned that word callous, which I've been saying for a long time, what, what that really means and how it prepares you. The what you're experiencing now is gonna prepare you for the next time it comes. And that's right. and that's really what callous means. And 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 last but not least, um you have that tenacity. You have it. That's why you've had your entire career, and that's what's your your fire, and that's what drives you, but you also have your compass. You also have your North Star. You also have that point that guides you. Scott McGregor, what is your North Star? It's really to leave a lasting impact uh, on the world and realizing that I may just be a ring in the ripple. Um, and I think too many times people feel disenfranchised because they feel like, hey, I'm only one person or, hey, my company's small, so what can I really do? Um, but recognizing that if you do something, whether it's give, you know, write books or whether it's give, you know, bags of goodies to the homeless or any of the other things that, that we try to do to make the world a better place, maybe that inspires one other person and it has that ripple effect. So, I, you know, I want people to look back and say he left, you know, the world a better place. And he was a ripple and maybe, you know, we inspired somebody along the way. I love it, man. Tremendous. Scott McGregor, I want to thank you for spending some time with us and my audience and, and sharing so much uh, about you, your background and what you stand for, what your company stands for. It's commendable. And I want to thank you for our relationship. And I really look forward to seeing where that goes. Um, Scott, where could folks find you? Where could they connect with you? Where could they learn more? Best bet is definitely LinkedIn. Um, you know, send me a message. I love to connect with good people. Um, and, you know, I'm uh, much less active on Instagram, but that's more like personal stuff. Uh, you can connect with me there. Facebook uh, literally says, like, go to LinkedIn because I really don't use it. Um, so that's, uh -oh. uh, that's that's the best bet. And this must be our – this is our signal that we're, that we're done. And we're, and we're wrapping up here. Well, Scott, thank you so much. And to everyone listening, 
at home in the car, hopefully on your way to work one of these days, we'll get back there. I appreciate you. And I really appreciate everyone taking the time uh, and, and to really listen and engage. And I hope you gained a ton of value from this episode and all of our other episodes. You can find us on the podcast.com. If you like this episode, if you found value in it, please share it. Please leave a review rating. It really helps all of us here. You know where to find us, all the social media channels, the website I mentioned before, podcast.com. Please remember, Wash your hands, stay six feet apart, take care of each other, and catch us next week for another great episode of the podcast. Wisdom is forever, but for us, it's time to go. Thank you for joining us. Luckily, we'll be back with our next episode soon, jam-packed with more incredible humans. Thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing. To join the conversation, search the podcast on LinkedIn. And to catch up on past episodes and more info, please visit www.thepausecast.com.